Welcome to this edition of NYSE Governance Services Inside Compliance. My name is Eric Moorhead. I'm Vice President and Senior Compliance Counsel with NYSE Governance Services. And today my guest is Andrea Boning Block, the CEO of GEC Risk Advisory. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, crisis planning and a risk-based approach to crisis planning. I know that's something that you've studied and uh, written on uh, here, uh, here in the last few years. Can you tell us a little bit about how that fits into the broader compliance risk assessment process? Sure. So it really was born out of uh, experience that I had in my early days as an executive uh, working as a general counsel of a uh, global power company where we were developing uh, power plants and ac acquisitions and due diligence all over the world in some very um, crisis-ridden places like Colombia, uh, when it had guerrilla warfare. So um, very quickly I realized we needed to have a crisis management plan in place. And so we did that and one of the things that I developed for that company and then later for other companies was basically an approach where we created the plan in advance and we did team exercises, so experiential learning in advance. Um, and a lot of the topics that I would talk about were the topics that came out of our um, governance, risk, and compliance portfolio. So we had fraud issues, we had corruption issues. Um, at the time we didn't have cybercrime issues, but clearly those are very important now. Um, uh, there were other potential health and safety issues, environmental issues. So to me it's extremely important for ethics and compliance officers to be part of that crisis management process. Whether they are key members or not of the team, um, they need to be present when a topic that relates to their portfolio is a crisis topic and they need to be there also for the training piece and the education piece because the more prepared you are the better you're going to handle the crisis and I had a second experience very similar when I was working for Bertelsmann the German media company I was their chief ethics and compliance officer and we started a crisis management plan and we used it was deployed two weeks before the East Coast blackout in 2004 I think it was so these things become very useful to being able to be ready and dealing with, with important critical topics. You, you bring up, an, and as a follow-up, you bring up an interesting point that I, I've noticed before, and uh, particularly you, talk, you mentioned data, data security and data privacy. Uh, it seems like sometimes the crisis management of that topic in particular, at least recently, is very siloed to the IT yeah. uh, group. Yeah. Can you talk just a little bit about how, how that is not a good idea and, yeah, and, yeah. and potentially dangerous for me? So uh, in another company I work for, which is a technology company, we actually created an information um, governance uh, committee. Uh, and we also had a crisis committee. But the information governance committee really set the policy for the overall company. Uh, and it included a total cross-functional group of people, including business people, heads of businesses, as well as the head of IT, head of information security, myself, I was the head of uh, risk and, and corporate responsibility. So we had a very cross-functional approach to dealing with these issues. And I think it's absolutely a must in today's world where it's very complicated and everything moves at the speed of light um, that we have people um, that are uh, helping each other solve the problem. And something like cyber uh, issues and data privacy is changing constantly. Um, new things are happening and we need to be prepared. And so put all your collective brain power together rather than keeping them in silos. Not just an IT issue. Yeah. No, yeah. definitely not. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, read this because I want to get it right. You have a, brand, a new book that's going to be coming out this fall uh, with the publisher DO Sustainability called The Reputation Risk Handbook, A Practical Guide for Managers, Executives, and Directors. Um, and uh, that's talking about reputational risk. Can you, uh, that's another topic that I think, uh, the, the reputation of the organization and the risk behind that, that isn't often associated with the compliance uh, yeah. function. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how that is important and how it relates? Sure, so you know, one of the things that I, when I started writing this book, um, I realized my entire career has been about reputation management in a way. Um, I've come at it as a general counsel, as a chief compliance officer, risk, uh, corporate responsibility. But at the end of the day, reputation is, um, a lot of people think of it as a soft concept. It's not. It's intangible, but it's an asset. And it has very tangible consequences. Uh, if you just look at the stock drop from one day to the next, for example, for certain companies that have had a scandal revealed, one day to the next you can have a 5% stock drop, even 10%. Uh, and we're seeing that in some of the bank, uh, you know, uh, fines that have been imposed. Some of the stocks have been declining. Um, and likewise, when you look at reputation statistics, um, when a company does the right thing and plugs in all the right programs and actually uh, improves their uh, internal organizational resilience, 
their, um, their prices go up, their stock goes up, and their reputation goes up. And it's all about the stakeholder expectations of what the company's going to do and whether they meet them or not. And so for compliance and ethics, to me, um, we have a number of subjects that relate directly to reputation. If you're found to be doing corrupt uh, practices in, in China, for example, that hits your reputation. That's a direct compliance topic. Um, if you have um, uh, human rights violations, uh, you're a retail chain and you know you had something to do with Rana Plaza, that is um, a corporate uh, responsibility topic, but it's also an ethics and compliance topic. So um, ethics and compliance officers have a lot of the reputational piece in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that that, uh you know, as you say, it's in the headlines, so mm -hmm. it's hard to not hard to deny. And and the other thing I, I do want to say is, um, and then part of the reason I wrote the book is, there's not a much out there that talks about this issue, and people are struggling to understand it. At the same time, it, there's been a recognition for the first time in the last couple of years by the highest levels of organizations, meaning boards basically, sometimes C-suites too, that reputation risk is their number one risk, number one strategic risk. So how are they going to tackle it? There, are, there need to be solutions. So part of uh, the, the drivers behind my doing the book is for me to sort of encapsulate some of my ideas and, and come up with some practical topics that, that might help companies and, and boards uh, figure that out. Um, in our last uh, uh, discussion on video, you teased the notion of turning risk into value. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's not keep anybody in suspense of any longer. Not. <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, give us some concrete examples sure. uh, of, of uh, situations where your compliance risk can be sure. changed into value sure. for the organization? So one of the uh, reasons I started my own business a little, uh, almost two years ago, um, was I had been on the inside in companies trying to build the programs, create resilience, and so on. And it's, a, it's an uphill battle very often depending on how the leadership feels about you know, putting in all the right uh, resources and, and programs. Um, and so uh, one of the things that really drives me, has driven me for many years, is the idea that what we do actually has value, but it's very hard to prove. You know, we're all struggling with quantitative um, you know, expressions of how does an ethics and compliance program add value to the bottom line. I think there are some connections to that. But I think there's some very important qualitative things. And so if companies understand what their risks are, and they actually tackle them not just as a uh, negative thing that needs to be mitigated and destroyed and so on, but actually look at the almost the root cause of why the risk happened and then do an analysis, sort of almost a reverse engineering. Um, they might find that there are processes and other things going on within their company that they can improve that might create a business advantage or a value in the bottom line, um, maybe even a better product and service. And so I've actually had a group of Columbia University students that I've been working with on looking at some cases. And we have several very interesting cases that we've developed that are not quite ready for prime time yet, but, <laughs> but I can name some of the companies. Siemens is a really good example because Siemens had the awful corruption uh, conundrum. Um, and they, they, you know, they, they solved the issue with, they, they settled the issue, but then they went beyond. They actually said, okay, we're going to be the, the paragon. We're going to show how the best kind of anti-corruption, global anti-corruption program can be created. Nothing is foolproof, but they've created sort of the, the paradigm of this. And, um, and they've been putting seed money into other areas, the World Bank and so on. So they've transformed a risk into value. It puts them in a better place, both in terms of their own practice and also perception, reputation, right? Um, and so there are others. There's a, a New Zealand uh, dairy company called Fonterra that had a big supply chain risk issue uh, related to the baby formula, mm -hmm. melamine, of one of their suppliers in China. They could have walked away and said, we'll cut our losses. Instead, they analyzed the whole, um, the whole parameters of, of their relationship to the industry in, in China and decided to change their business model to own 100% of the dairy farms in China instead of have a supply chain. Mm -hmm. And now they're the, apparently the, the most successful dairy uh, company supplying China. So, you know, there are ways to sort of look at your risk in the eye and not just mitigate it, but, but create value, and, I think. And make the business case. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, as the people who do GRC, governance risk compliance, we need to do more and more to convince the business people that we actually add value and we don't do a good job. So I think we need to... It's, it's kind of the traditional, the lawyers are the people who say no. Yeah. We don't always have to, we might, we might say no, but here's why. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's and, a little harder yeah. for general counsel to make these cases because the general counsel is protecting the legal integrity yeah. of their own. But I think those of us who do the governance, the risk, the compliance, the ethics, we have a little more room to roam to, to be a little bit more uh, connected to the business strategy from a value creation standpoint. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs>
Well, Andrea, I can't thank you enough for joining us once again uh, sure. on Inside Compliance, and thank you for joining us as well, and please join us for the next uh, edition of Inside Compliance. Mm -hmm.